for you to watch on YouTube. And with this, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Desiree Roerding uh, from University of Bergen. She's originally from um, Poland. Uh, she did her undergraduate master and PhD in Ultrich. Uh, did PhD with Paul Mason, uh, who is here. Uh, and uh, she focused on Archean, Paleoarchean uh, barite from Barberton Greenstone Belt. Uh, she worked uh, also with Thomas Reimer and um, we analyzed sul multiple sulfur isotopes and uh, strontium isotopes to reconstruct paleo environment. And uh, for last seven years uh, or eight years, she was at the University of Bergen in uh, Norway, where she sort of evolved from a researcher, postdoc, and assistant professor to associate professor and broaden her horizon by working on modern hydrothermal systems, applying similar sort of traditional and non-traditional isotopes. So in addition to sulfur, uh, she runs multi-collector ICPMS for iron and uh, uh, zinc, and also for uh, she did work on silica isotopes. So with this, I pass it to Desiree. Uh, Desiree, take it. OK. Thanks very much, Andre, for the introduction. Um, so hi, everyone. And um, today I would like to kind of talk a little bit about what Andre was talking about earlier that I did during my PhD. I would, I would basically like to sort of take you through the major discoveries that have been made about the Archean environment based on the mineral in this outcrop, barite. Um, so as my title kind of already suggested, these, the fact that we find barite in the early Archean rock record is actually a bit of a paradox. Um, throughout the rock record, we see that the abundance of sulfate deposits reflects um, uh, redox conditions on the Earth's surface. Um, this is because when we have low atmospheric oxygen, um, for example, here in the Archean, seawater sulfate concentrations are low as well because um, under low oxygen atmosphere, oxidative weathering is absent as a, as a source for sulfate. And therefore, sulfur will be primarily buried in those, uh, in, in, under those conditions as sulfide and not as sulfate. So we see basically that only by the time that sulfate, that oxygen levels have gone to modern day levels, sulfate levels have gone up to modern day sulfate concentrations in seawater, that the sulfate uh, becomes a, a, an abundant mineral in the rock record. Now, the Paleoarchean is a remarkable exception to this, um, as we find in this period, large bedded barite deposits um, um, in, in the Paleoarchean. So what is actually perhaps more, even more remarkable is that we find these deposits across three different cratons, as you can see in this overview here. So it's not just a, a single location where we just have a little bit of barite. It's something that we consistently find in both uh, the Kapfal, Pilbara, and Darwa cratons. The oldest deposit that we know of is the uh, 3.52 Londosi deposit in the Barberton Greenstone Belt in Eswatini. And the youngest of them is the, the Sargar barite, 3.2 billion years old in um, Western India. Um, now, there is still an ongoing debate about the exact origin of these deposits, and I, I don't want to focus too much on that today, but I would just like to highlight some similarities between these deposits that are important to, to keep in mind when we discuss the geochemistry of these barites uh, later on in this talk. So, First of all, all these barite deposits, at least the ones that, that, were, that we studied, are, are found in marine successions, um, although there are some differences in depositional environments. So here you see a photo of what we interpreted as mafic pillow lavas, now metamorphosed, um, as the host rocks of the Londosi barite deposit um, in the Barbara Greenstone Belt. Um, other deposits are, for example, hosted in thalsic volcanic clastic rock. Um, oh, I hear somebody talking. Yeah, cheers. Um, uh, or classic sedimentary rocks like the Barrett Valley deposit in uh, in South Africa, but but all are part of of marine successions, marine settings. 
all barrier deposits also occur as stratiform deposits. So they occur in horizons parallel to sedimentary or volcanic bedding. And here is a photo that you can see um, that this is sort of demonstrated. You can see this erosional contact between classic sedimentary rocks and the barite at, uh, at Barite Valley in South Africa, um, it, providing evidence for thin sedimentary barite deposition. Um, also at other deposits, for example, the Sargor and Londosi barites, we find evidence for barite having formed as a primary deposit. We find, for example, alteration zones only below the barite and not above, so arguing against sort of secondary barite formation in, um, in veins. Now, thirdly, all the barite deposits are very strongly associated with silicification and church. And this is occurring on different scales from, for example, here, strongly silicified zones in the nearby host rocks. This is again at, uh, at, Lond at the Londosi deposits where we have um, sort of less silicified basalt, metabasalts and, and highly silicified metabasalts, very clearly shown here by the white color. Um, but we also find it on a smaller scale. We find, for example, turret in between bedded barite, um, as you can see here on the, the picture on the left, or turret surrounding the sort of domal um, structure uh, uh, barite deposits. Um, and even if we zoom more out um, in the, at the this barite valley deposit that I just showed the pictures from, we, we actually see quite a, a clear correlation between the chert dikes and, uh, and the barite, as you can see here on this um, annotated drone map that we made a few years ago. Um, and so you can see that there, is, there seems to be a clear correlation between the barite deposit deposition and the presence of these, of these dikes. And also when we analyze the, the chemistry of these dikes, they seem to be, they have contained about one, one and a half weight percent of barium oxide compared to about half weight percent um, of the for the surrounding sedimentary host rock. So potentially these chert dikes are involved as a, as a, in the supply of barium rich fluids to the barite themselves. So based on these observations, um, we can build a, a conceptual model for the environment in which the barites were deposited. Here is a model shown that was um, published by Don Lowe and, the, and colleagues uh, two years ago for the barite valley deposit. And um, basically the kind of setting that, we're, that we seem to deal with for these barites is some kind of a marine hydrothermal setting where the barite precipitates on the seafloor as a result of interaction between hydrothermal fluids and seawater. Um, so here and potentially these barium rich fluids being supplied then by, by the folds as we saw it at the, at the previous map of Barrett Valley. Now, what is also interesting to note is that none of the barites is associated with massive sulfides. Um, also, the, the actual extent of those veins and dikes is, is rather limited. The map that I just showed, they, they don't go, uh, this, these are not veins that extend for hundreds of meters. They're relatively, to a relatively limited extent. And also when we analyze the, the rare earth and rare earth element composition of the church, we don't see typical positive European anomaly that we would expect for high temperature systems. So all these lines of evidence are kind of consistent with the barite forming in a relatively low temperature hydrothermal system, um, possibly something below 150 degrees. And that is important information to keep in mind um, when we are going to look at the isotope G chemistry. And I will, I will get back to that a couple of times uh, times today. Um, so the, um, the deposits that are shown here in bold, they're actually the ones that we've, that we've that have been studied so far. Um, and so what I will do for the rest of the talk today is show you the, those data um, and discuss with you what that means for uh, what we can extract from that for, in, in terms of the Paleo-Rakine environment. So let's start with the sulfur isotope record. This figure shows the Archean sulfur isotope record for delta 34S here on the y-axis and then age on the x-axis. And this record largely reflects um, basically sulfur redox reactions, um, such as, uh, for example, microbial or thermochemical sulfate reduction. Now the barite makes up an important part of this record. 
you can see uh, the the position of the or the the data for the barite being shown here in orange. So why is that? Well, we're talking about redox reactions that that cause the variations in this delta 30 per s. Um, and so the interpretation of sulfur isotope data from sulfites, the, the, the most dominant phase that we've measured, um, this requires also a, an isotope recomposition of the oxidized sulfur species. So where this, the sulfides, the pyrite, for example, represents a reduced sulfur form, um, interpreting those, th those isotope data requires also knowledge of the isotope composition of the oxidized sulfur form. Um, so for example, on the modern earth, seawater sulfate has a delta 34 S of around plus 21. So when we look at pyrite in modern marine sediments to trace microbial cycling, we look at how the pyrite delta 34 S is shifted away from that value of, of 21 per mil. And so for the Archean earth, we have the barite that provides this reference frame for the Paleoarchean. Um, and you can actually see here that in this uh, in this figure that it is in very distinct in its isotopic composition from that that is measured in um, the the sulfides. Um, and the magnitudes of those shifts that we see around uh, fifteen to twenty uh, per mil are consistent with somebody's drawing on this are consistent with uh, microbial sulfate reduction. Um, as uh, shown, for example, by uh, Shannon all and colleagues for the North Pole barite in the early 2000s. Um, in addition, we could see that based on our the comparison of the barite delta 3 for us, um, we see an overall uh, increasing magnitude of um, the shift between the barite and the and the pyrite in delta 3 for us, uh, which which may reflect increasing sulfate concentrations towards the um, the end of the um, the New Yorkian and into the Proterozoic. But it's actually interesting to, to note that uh, New Yorkian sulfate, we only have carbonate associated sulfate being measured there, um, has, a, has a similar positive delta 34 S signature to the barite, although the range is obviously much larger. So this seems to be tapping a different kind of reservoir than, than what we have in the barite. Now, the variations that we just looked at, they represent mass dependent fractionation of sulfur isotopes. So this means um, that, the, uh, that the change in the ratio of 33 over 32 sulfur, um, so indicated by this delta 33S, is expected to be approximately half that of the change in 34, the, two, the 232 ratio. And that's just because of the difference in, um, in, in masses between the isotopes. So this is shown here, the, the, the relation that we expect then in the case of abiotic and biological reactions are, is shown here by this, uh, this black line. However, the sulfur isotope compositions of Archean sulfide and sulfate, they actually show fractionation that does not show that predicted mass dependency. And this is represented then by points that plot either above or below this black line. And this is what we call mass independent fractionation. Um, and um, this is what we then uh, uh, identify with a non-zero values of this cap delta 33 value. So basically this cap delta value is just the, um, the degree to which the, the delta 33 value that we measure differs from the value that we would expect based on this, this line. Now, the reason that we see this in Archean uh, sulfur minerals is, uh, is now generally accepted to be related to photolysis reactions in um, the Archean atmosphere. And this is demonstrated by this, uh, best demonstrated by this, this well-known figure um, here showing cap delta 33 again versus H. And um, what we see here is that we have large non-zero cap delta 33 values until about 2.4 billion years ago when oxygen levels in the atmosphere increased. Um, you can see on this plot that the barite has a distinct negative, oops, sorry, negative cap delta 33 value. Um, and uh, taking into account the model of barite formation that we just that we just looked at involving deposition in a marine setting, 
it is likely that this captures the sulfur that was produced in this atmospheric reaction. And in fact, the barite might actually be our best constraint on the types of atmospheric source reactions that produce this mass independent isotope fractionation, because sulfate is actually the only of the two photolysis products that is actually directly preserved in the rock record. Um, the other product, elemental sulfur, is uh, only preserved indirectly in sulfite minerals such as pyrite, but this involves redox processes and mixing of potentially mixing diff of different sulfite sources. Um, so MIF signatures might therefore be disturbed. On the other hand, the sulfate is directly stored in barite as sulfate. There is no changes there. And um, so the, the, this mass independent fractionation the signature may have only just been muted by addition of, for example, mantle derived sulfur, sulfate. Um, so that at least the sign of this, uh, this CAPDEL 33 value is, uh, is preserved in the barite. Hey, Desiree, I think, I don't know how to clear these drawings. Um, yeah, I don't know. Can... Shall I, maybe I don't if I- how they happen. No, me, I think, I don't know, but I don't know how to clean them. Um, let's see, can I? do something here. I, I'm also getting a little bit annoyed by them. Um, yeah, you can go to annotate and okay. then clear. No, nope. whoever, whoever made the joints can clear them. <laughs> I don't see annotate. Oh, hold on. Here we go. Um, clear. No. Okay. Clear all, but sometimes it just clear uh, the joints. Uh, and you yes, move. there we go. Yes, thank you okay. very much. That did the trick. Excellent. Hey, yes. Thanks, you. Hi. <laughs> got rid of the yellow lines. Okay. Hey. Um, so, um, okay. So we just um, talk, or I just uh, argued that basically the barite is a is a is a recorder of. The, the sulfate that is produced in, um, in atmospheric photolysis reactions. Um, now, having said that, there is actually still a discrepancy between the results from lab experiments and modeling results for photolysis and the rock record. So um, well, this has also led to suggestions that maybe the barite did not trap that photochemical sulfate, but was, for example, produced by uh, microbial oxidation of sulfide. Um, however, if we look at the overall barite sulfur isotope record, then I would argue that it seems more likely that the barite traps this, this photochemical sulfate via seawater um, and, uh, and possibly at a, at a global rather than, than a, a local scale. And the reason for that is, um, I'll try to explain with these two figures. Here on the left, you see the two mass independent isotope signatures plotted against each other um, for all the barites that have been analyzed so far. So here, this is the legend that belongs to that same plot. And you can see that they basically all plot on a similar line with a slope of minus one, which has been suggested to be representative for the photochemical reactions in, in the Archean atmosphere. Um, so it seems that, that the barites represent kind of like a single source reaction in, in terms of atmospheric photolysis. We don't see the changes that people have observed in, for example, New Yorkian successions, um, where this, this ratio, um, this slope of the line shifts. Um, also on the right side, you can see cap delta 33 versus delta 34s. And this also shows actually remarkably similar isotope compositions for all the barites. Um, so we see very similar delta 34s values in all the barites. And this I would argue is difficult to explain um, with, a, with the microbial origin, um, because you would expect that then you see different different isotope effects in, in the different barite deposits. And here they are very consistently all showing a similar delta 34S value. What's also interesting is that there is a distinct grouping um, in these deposits where there is a decrease in cap del 33 through time. Um, and this most likely represents a seawater evolution um, because the, the grouping is only related to Really to age and not to, for example, different depositional settings or different different cratons. So, for example, the green dots, the green and the blue dots here, they include um, barites from both um, the Darwar craton as well as from the Kampfel craton. Now, 
in addition to using that the cap delta 33 to say something about the atmospheric processes themselves, we can use this in the sulfate to actually look into microbial metabolisms as well. Um, so the way this works is that this cap delta 33 value is preserved in biological reactions. And so we can basically distinguish between sulfate that was produced in the atmosphere with a negative cap delta 33 value um, and microbial processes that use, so that use elemental sulfur that, was, uh, that carries um, a positive cap delta 33 value. So in other words, if we measure the pyrite, the sulfide, we can derive what the source was that this pyrite was originally from, if it came from elemental sulfur or from sulfate. And so if we apply this then to um, this concept to sulfites from a drill core um, through the Mapebe formation. So this is the same location as where the barite valley barite occurs. Then we see a clear difference in isotope signatures between the sulfites hosted in barite here on the left and the sulfites hosted in the clastic sedimentary rocks on here on the right. So in the barite rich rocks, we see pyrite with negative delta 34s, the, the gray dots here, and negative cap delta 33. And this is consistent with an origin that is derived from microbial sulfate reduction and uh, perhaps with some mixing of, of mental sulfide um, in, this, uh, in this system. In contrast, in, in the barite free rocks, we do not observe these signatures at all. Um, but we see mostly pyrite with positive capital 33. Um, so these have a different origin and are um, uh, can be explained by being derived from, from elemental sulfur, from an elemental sulfur source. And we actually also see a mixing trend here. Um, this is uh, possibly, uh, this might be sulfite that was actually produced by sulfate reducers, but just at sulfate levels that were below the threshold for which um, biological isotope effects occur. Um, so within this single drill core, we see a clear difference between barite rich and barite free settings. And what's interesting is that we actually see the same pattern when we zoom further out and then look at a compilation of sulfur isotope data from the entire Barberton Greenstone belt. So now we're looking at barite deposits um, that range in age between 3.52 and 3.23 billion years ago, billion years old. And um, also here, we, we basically see the same sort of pattern repeated. We see that the pyrite that is hosted in barite is largely, uh, largely carries a, a negative cap del 33 value um, uh, and goes down to quite negative delta 34 S values. And then contrast the, the, the sulfides, the pyrite that is in clastic sedimentary rocks um, is again, much more dominated by a positive cap del 33 value. And actually this is something we see both in, in the bulk data here, the, the, the blue squares and the, 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 the in-situ data, the SIMS data in the, the light blue, uh, light blue um, symbols. So this is consistent across analytical techniques. So we see this at sort of deposit scale, we see it at um, greenstone belt scale, but we even see it when we look, when we make a compilation of the global rock record. Um, and uh, this is demonstrated in these figures here. So here we have um, pyrite um, that is associated with barite. So this is mostly from the Paleoarchean. And here we see um, pyrites that are, uh, in, uh, uh, in classic sedimentary rocks. And there, here on the right side, we have pyrites in Bennett iron formations and churts. And interestingly enough, we see again, also on this, this sort of global record for the whole uh, EU Archean and Paleo Archean, uh, the whole Archean, sorry, um, that we have a much more present positive cap del 33 in the classic sedimentary settings than we have in the barite. Um, and also if we compare the barite to other chemical sediments like the Bennett iron formation and the church, we see actually a much smaller magnitude in, uh, in, in the delta 34S. Um, we see a much smaller range in delta 34S values than what we see in the barite. Um, we only see this expanding in when we go towards the paleoproterozoic because of um, increased sulfate concentrations. So what does that mean? What do these distinct sulfur isotope signatures in this barite hosted pyrite 
what does that tell us? Well, I think that this can be best explained um, as a consequence of slightly increased sulfate concentrations in the settings where the barite is formed. Um, and this is related to this is then related to the, the the relationship between microbial sulfur isotope effects and sulfate concentrations. This is shown here in this model by Sean Crow and colleagues that basically the higher the sulfate concentration, the the, the more isotope the, the the larger the isotope effect you you could expect. And so if we basically use this model and look at the isotope fractionation we typically see in the barite. Um, then we would get to a concentration of around eight micromolar of sulfate for the barite forming environments, which is elevated above the, the global average of about two and a half micromolars for the Archean. So this suggests that the barites may have been some kind of marine sulfate oasis, um, where sulfate concentrations were slightly elevated and microbial sulfate reducers could kind of flourish. And, and at the same time, barite could be deposited. And then outside of these sulfate oases, sulfate reducers may still have been present, but maybe they were outcompeted by the reduced sulfur metabolisms, or they just simply did not produce a sizable enough shift in, in delta 34s to, to become visible in the, in the rock record. Um, so, well, what produced those, those enrichment is, is still something that is a bit unknown. Um, we can just only speculate really for now. This might be related to some kind of evaporative enrichment or perhaps local input by volcanic eruptions or maybe even some very localized sulfite weathering happening. Um, but uh, this is still a bit of an unresolved um, issue. However, if we do take these data that we get from, or if we take that concentration that we then derive from our biological isotope effect, then um, and we have these these little enrichments, or these 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 um, uh, these this slight enrichment in sulfate concentrations in these marine sulfate oases, then then are they are those barites really still such a paradox after all? Um, so I just did kind of like a back of the envelope calculation. Um, if we take the, the total deposit size at Barite Valley in this case, where we have 22 million tons of barite, and this is divided roughly over four major seams. Um, so that corresponds to about 23 billion moles of sulfate in one seam. At a sulfate concentration of eight micromolar, which we just derived, this would require then almost 300 billion cubic meters of seawater to supply the sulfate needed to form the barite. And this, of course, sounds like an enormous amount of water. However, I guess this is where, you know, working on modern hydrothermal systems maybe gives a different perspective. Because if you compare that to actually similar kind of settings on the modern Earth, similar low temperature hydrothermal settings, um, and look at the mass fluxes that we have in those kind of, in those kind of systems, they are actually they are really large. Um, and, um, and from that, if you take these mass fluxes, then you could, you could calculate that it would take about 20 to 400 years to precipitate one seam of barite, even though you have only eight micromolars of sulfate. Well, if that number is, if that number is uh, what that number really means, I mean, we, we don't really have any real constraints on how long it it would take to grow the barite, but at least this number seems seems reasonable. We're not talking about millions of years that you would need to actually grow barite at such low sulfate concentrations in a low temperature hydrothermal system. So maybe the barites are actually not such a paradox after all, if you take this, this kind of system into, um, into account. Okay, so in addition to the marine sulfate oasis um, that, are, that we've now sort of derived from the sulfur isotope record, we can learn more about the depositional environment of the barite using the radiogenic strontium isotopes. And barite is actually a great mineral for this tracer because strontium can substitute for barium in the crystal structure because of similar ionic radius, um, but barite excludes the radioactive parent of rubidium. So, this means that we can actually trap, that the barite can trap 
the 87-86 strontium isotope ratio um, from the fluid from which it formed. And, and even though time passes, even though three and a half billion years pass, that ratio will not change in the barite because there is no production of radiogenic strontium um, within the barite because of the absence of rubidium. So basically we can take the present day strontium isotope values that we measure in the barite and use this to say something about the fluids from which the barites formed and then further trying to build on this, this model of the, the environment that, that the barites reflect. So um, this basically means that we can then use the Paleoarchean barite in the same way as that carbonates have been used in the Phenerozoic to reconstruct um, seawater compositions and, uh, and relative fluxes of weathering and hydrothermal activity. So the way that this works is that material derived from the oceanic crust, for example, strontium from hydrothermal circulation, hydrothermal vents, this is characterized by low 87, 86 strontium values um, whereas material that is derived from the continental crust has much higher strontium isotope ratios. Now, it is also important to note here, particularly since we just talked about these sulfate oases and that the barites may reflect like, you know, different, different locations or locations where we have slight sulfate enrichments. Um, in relation to, to the strontium isotopes, the oceans are actually homogeneous with respect to um, with respect to the strontium isotope ratios. And this has also been, been suggested to be the case for the Archean oceans. And it's basically the result of a long residence time of strontium in the oceans compared to, um, to oceanic mixing times. And so even in restricted basins, um, like on the modern earth, you still expect to, to basically have strontium reflecting global, um, uh, global strontium isotope composition of, of seawater. So because of that, um, the, the relative importance of weathering fluxes can then, be, uh, can then be recorded as, for example, is increased strontium isotope ratios in, uh, in marine chemical sediments, like the barite. And so this has been done for the Phanerozoic. We have um, excellent strontium isotope curves for there. And this is because in the Phanerozoic, this is relatively easy. We can use marine carbonates um, as this is the most abundant chemical sediment in the rock record. Um, but in the early Archean, um, these carbonates are very scarce and those that we do have are typically quite altered. So previously, the strontium isotope curve for, uh, for the Archean seawater was thought to basically be uh, like a mental-like composition, basically follow the mental, mental curve um, until about 2.7 billion years ago, and, and therefore implying that there was very little input of weathering into Archean seawater um, at that time. However, uh, in five years ago, a paper was published by Aaron Setkowski and colleagues where they demonstrated actually that barite, 3.2 billion year old barite, had a much more radiogenic, much higher strontium isotope value than this presumably mental like curve. Um, so this question basically if this, this curve was really, uh, was really correct for this time. And so what we did then is basically um, build upon this and use all the barites that we, that we analyzed previously for sulfur isotopes to try and actually then construct a seawater strontium isotope curve for the Paleoarchaean and, and determine the importance of weathering at this time and the importance um, for uh, um, um, of, uh, of uh, the input of nutrients, for example, at this time to the ocean. Um, having said that, doing that is not necessarily straightforward because we have to remember that our barites form in a hydrothermal setting. So um, using strontium isotopes values from the barite um, that formed in these, um, in these, uh, uh, sorry, um, I was just reading the chat. <laughs> so uh, if we use the strontium isotope values from the barite, we have to take into account that basically some hydrothermal strontium could have been mixed in with seawater strontium. Um, so to derive actual seawater values from the barites, um, uh, we have to basically select the samples that are most seawater-like. 
So here on the left side, you can see an overview of the barites that we analyzed. So these are all, uh, these are the deposits that we looked at. And um, you can see that there's a distinction between bladed barite and granular barite. And we make that distinction because we expect that the bladed barite is the more primary barite. This has not uh, been recrystallized, um, for example, during metamorphism and also we expect that the, that the primary form of barite that is growing is, in a, is, is a bladed crystal form. What is interesting then, if we also use other selection criteria, um, like the sulfur isotopic composition of the, of the same barites, that we again see that these, that these bladed barites um, seem to be more seawater-like than the granular barites. And, this is shown here on the right side in this plot showing the strontium isotope values versus cap delta 33. Um, now remember, we saw earlier that this cap delta 33, we see a temporal evolution in, um, in, uh, in these values going to, towards less negative values um, throughout, the throughout the Paleoarchean. And interestingly enough, we see that the, the bladed barite, the strontium isotope values correlate nicely with that that evolution, suggesting that we're looking here at some kind of a, a seawater evolution the, um, in, uh, in both, both strontium and, and sulfur isotope ratios. So basically, based on, on selection criteria, and we've also looked at oxygen isotopes and delta-34S, it seems that the, the bladed barite is the most seawater-like barite that we could possibly get. But again, still, we have to remember that we are dealing with a, a, a hydrothermal system. So even if we have those, those barites that are most seawater-like, there could still be a component of hydrothermal input into them. So to kind of make up for that, we sort of calculate like an uncertainty around the values, um, sort of a range of seawater values that would be potentially consistent with the values that we measure in the barite. So to do that, we basically used a, um, a mixing model um, where we are looking at different scenarios, different mixtures of hydrothermal fluids and seawater to calculate um, uh, to calculate which seawater values are consistent with the values that we that we measure in the barite. And so, if we do that, we get a curve that is shown here in uh, this trend here shown in blue. So you can see this is basically is more than just a line because this is the range that we calculate from our mixing model. Um, and even though this is not a beautiful single line, it shows very clearly that the, that the seawater strontium isotope curve for the paleoarchean is very different from the mantle-like curve. Um, consistent with findings from Aaron Setkowski earlier based on, on, on slightly younger samples. And, um, and actually, interestingly enough, it also plots in between model scenarios of the, the seawater strontium isotope curve. Um, so in addition to present showing a new or a revised strontium isotope curve, this plot actually also highlights the importance of the barite record for this time because the carbonates in this in this period in the Paleoarchean are scarce and they you can see that they are altered to highly radiogenic values. So they don't represent the the seawater um, strontium isotope composition anymore. Um, and in fact, because the barite record consists of a number, number of deposits, six deposits in total spread out over 300 million years, we can actually obtain a trend that we can then carefully extrapolate further back in time to its intersection with the mental curves to try and, and constrain to obtain a timing for the, the onset of, um, of weathering. And so when we do that in this figure, we end up with a timing roughly at about 3.7 billion years um, ago. This is where we see that the strontium isotope chemistry of the Archean oceans is starting to deviate significantly from this mental curve that we expect um, the oceans to have before weathering basically starts to kick in. So if that extrapolation is correct, um, well, it suggests then that life may have already been supplied with nutrients from weathering um, in the, the earliest of the Paleoarchean. And well, perhaps this explains the evidence for, for microbial activity as we've seen from our barite sulfur isotope record. If these were 
um, if nutrients were basically supplied to our marine sulfate oases, then these were areas where, where life could have likely um, uh, flourished. Um, and so in addition, of course, when we're talking about crustal weathering, um, uh, this would have affected uh, uh, the uptake of CO2, for example, by subaerial weathering. Um, and we actually have also provided habitats for early life by, um, um, in, as in shallow marine habitats because of the um, uh, sort of creating epic continental seas, for example. So um, with that, um, I, so sort of to sum up then I've shown you, or I've tried to show you today that the Paleoarchean barite record provides us with, with key information about the early environment. And I've tried to summarize this in this figure here. So um, basically based on our field observations, the barite uh, appears to have formed in a, in a low temperature marine hydrothermal setting, and it captures sulfate that was produced in, in the low oxygen, low oxygen atmosphere through atmospheric photolysis. And interestingly, we find from our, from our multiple sulfur isotope studies, uh, both on combined barite and pyrite, that these barites seem to have represented a, a special habitat where microbial sulfate reduction was, was more significant than in, in the sulfate-free sedimentary environments, the, the clastic sedimentary represented by the clastic sedimentary rocks. And so they, they, may have represent, they may represent some kind of sulfate oasis where we had slightly elevated seawater sulfate concentrations and where um, microbial life, sulf microbial sulfate reduction, uh, they were basically happy in those kind of settings. Now those oases themselves, they may have been supplied by, uh, by nutrients from, um, uh, from continental weathering, uh, which the barite strontium isotope record also provides evidence for. Um, and, uh, and suggest to have started around 3.7 uh, billion years ago. So um, I guess uh, sort of to sort of sum up then everything I, I've, I've talked about for now, I guess my sort of the key point that I would like you to remember from today is that the barite's been really a critical part of the rock record to try and understand what was basically going on in the Paleoarchean and um, it's, uh, it, it fills gaps that we can otherwise, that, that are, uh, for example, in the weathering record, where we don't have other, um, uh, where we don't have other, other types of other records that could provide, that could help us with uh, unraveling what was happening in terms of weathering. And the barite here, for example, provides really a, it fills really that critical gap that we otherwise, um, yeah, would not be able to fill. So with that, um, I would like to thank uh, my, uh, collaborators on the, that have been working with, with us recently on the, uh, the Barite projects. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Desiree, that was great. Uh, we've already got some action in the, uh, in the chat for you. So mm -hmm. uh, our first one is from, uh, from Paul Hoffman. He says, are Paleoarchean Barites ever observed in deep water settings or only very shallow water ones? where ultraviolet radiation directly impinging on the surface might, in the absence of O2, produce other oxidant species like H2O2? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, well, I think this is a, it's a bit tri tricky to answer because we don't know for all the barites if they were really deep water or shallow water. Um, so for example, for Barite Valley, this definitely seems to be a very shallow water environment. But for example, for Londosi, we don't really have good depth constraints as such on, um, on, where, on, on, on the depth at which they were deposited. So um, it's difficult to answer that question. And um, yeah, I'm not sure if we actually will be really able to answer that question. We kind of have to rely on the chemistry in that sense to, to extract that they that they that we think that they formed in some kind of basins. Um, but how deep those basins were is difficult. It's, it's really difficult to say. Um, that's an interesting point. UV doesn't penetrate very far in water, so the depths wouldn't have to be very great. Yeah, I mean, um, I think 
Well, I mean, what depths are we talking about? Like several meters would be uh, sufficient. Yeah, I mean, like for example, at Barrett Valley. So we see the image that I showed me. We see that this is likely to be very, very shallow because we see erosional surfaces. So it, it looks like sometimes there was actually no water before other deposition occurred. But um, I would say that that's the that's the best studied barite deposits that we that we have. And so for other for the other deposits, I think this is actually very difficult to say if this was um, how how deep they were. But I would say that I mean I know that for example um, an older study on on the the 3.3 billion year old barite they've suggested that this was actually much more of a deep water setting. So yeah, it's a bit speculative. So I won't really be able to answer your question very well, I'm afraid. But um, it's definitely in the and it's an interesting point you're raising. All right. Um, I guess, Paul, we should follow up on yours before we get to John's questions. Um, your second one said 3.7 billion year old, uh, th sorry, 3.7 GA should represent not the onset of weathering, but the onset of weathering of crust that was significantly more radiogenic than seawater. Um, and Lee Kump further down says, or more radiogenic than ocean basalt. Yes, that, that's absolutely right. Sorry if that was not clear. Yes, so we're talking about that we need basically input of felsic um, high or, or radiogenic, high rubidium strontium, however you want to define this um, uh, crust, because that's what we need to basically shift the value, the strontium isotope value from um, from mantle-like values to to the higher values that we observe in the barite. So yes, you're absolutely right with that. Yeah. So this has nothing to do with the onset of nutrients for life. Well, um, if we start the on, if we start weathering of subaerial crust and we start to weather um, felsic crust, this would have implications for what kind of what kind of nutrients could be supplied to the oceans, of course. Well, it's not felsic. It's the crustal residence time that allows the the uh, eroded, weathered material to be radiogenic. Yes, but in order to get, I mean, if you are weathering, um, if you're weathering uh, mafic crust, it's difficult. I mean, you, you won't be able to get your, your strontium isotope values up that much by, by weathering a, a mafic material, because you need to have substantially radiogenic input of, the, of your, or you need to have substantially radiogenic well, strontium. Yeah. Yeah, yes, sure. exactly. And so um, I mean, we see that our, our curve, um, if we compare this to sort of estimated, um, I mean, we, we actually did a, a, a sort of a, an extra, extra study here that I didn't present today because of time limitations, but we tried to calculate how much crust you would actually need to have exposed um, in order to uh, to explain the variations that we see, assuming that we assuming a value for the, the continental crust or the the felsic crust and the and the mafic crust, and this is actually it's not that we're talking about a huge amount of 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 exposed material that we need. Actually, this is quite similar to um, to extents that have been suggested before. So we're talking about maybe five, maybe up to ten percent of ex of exposed crust. But what is interesting is that what we do see is that even though that sounds like a very small amount of of of, uh, of exposed crust, it was still significant enough to change the chemistry of the oceans, as recorded in the as recorded in the barites. All right. So Jean Bedard has a couple of things. It says he has two points slash questions. Mm -hmm. um, as first is there's. There's very little evidence for atmospheric exposure of Paleoarchean rocks. Um, so that's I'd rather I made the point myself, Alex. Oh, go right ahead, John. Yeah. You always yeah. say your own words better than I say them. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the first point is just there's not that much evidence for subaerial exposure of our Paleoarchean continental rocks. Typical parochial superior province perspective. <laughs> Anyway, I, I'm not arguing with you, Paul, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that's just a, one point. I, maybe I'm exposing my ignorance, but you say the sulfur uh, uh, has the isotopic signature of mass independent fractionation in the upper atmosphere, but how does that propagate into the hydrothermal vein? 
you'd have to dissolve it into a reducing ocean, react with rocks somewhere, mm -hmm. bury them, metamorphose them, degas, concentrate the fluid, which would move and have to react to precipitate. So what's the likelihood that you would not perturb your isotopic signal in all those steps? How confident are you that you really are seeing this signal? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for that question. So um, basically, the barite being hydrothermal means that the supply of barium is likely from a hydrothermal source, but the supply of sulfate is still required, is, is then basically just seawater. And so this is actually quite similar to what we see in, on the modern day Earth in the way that barite forms, because it's so, it's so insoluble, you, can, you cannot really have the sulfate and the barium being in the solution together before it before it precipitates. So um, basically, um, the sulfate doesn't really have to cycle through um, through all the. I'm just reading your your question. So basically, all that has to be done to the sulfate is to dissolve in into seawater, um, rain out into seawater from the atmosphere, and then um, basically. That's it. So you don't have to go through the the, the degassing and the and the metamorphic. Um, well, then how can it be hydrothermal? Itself. I mean, hydrothermal fluids have to have a, a rock source that's expelling hot fluid somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, it, so for example, on the modern Earth, right? We see that um, barite forms in hydrothermal settings when we have barite barium seeping out of the seafloor and reacting once it reaches the the, the sulfate in seawater and then precipitates out on the seafloor. And so it's likely to be a similar kind of setting where we have um, barium being supplied from below through those, for example, those um, uh, the fault or fractures that are now, that are now um, uh, um, these, uh, these chert dikes that we see. Um, and then basically once the barium comes up to the, to the surface, it reacts with the sulfate in seawater and therefore it also produces the, or, or generates these, these stratiform barite deposits over several hundred meters of, um, of, uh, of aerial extent. So I don't, I don't really think this is a problem um, because the, but we still call this a hydrothermal barite. It's just, a, I mean, you can argue about the name, but this is, this is the, one of the four mechanisms basically that is considered for barite formation. Um, so it's, it's different, for example, from di diagenetic barite, where the barium would be leached out of, out of sediment. Um, and um, well, in this case, we have a, we seem to have I, I, a, I still, a higher temperature fluid. I still have trouble understanding how this all works because uh, seafloor hydrothermal systems are often 400-ish degrees and are tapped from five or six kilometers down where there's hot gabbro. So anyway, I'm, uh, I'm exposing yeah. my ignorance here, but I still think I see a problem. Right. Well, the kind of systems, I mean, I'm not really, so this is why I mentioned it, that we're thinking this is more of a low temperature hydrothermal system. And so this is not really the, the, the hydrothermal system that you would classically think of like the black smoker sort of setting. This is more of a, diffuse kind of venting system. So um, not a system where you just have a single sort of hot, hot source fluid coming out, but a system where you have fluids, fluids circulating through the crust um, um, at the, in sort of a, a diffuse kind of setting. So well, this it, does happen in ocean ridge systems, but usually yeah. it's a calcium sulfate. So I, I'm kind of curious, why don't you have calcium sulfate too? Um, <laughs> That is a good question. So this might be related just to simply calcium concentrations in the Archean oceans, um, or alternatively, they could have been there but have just not been preserved. Um, third option is that basically because you have barite, it, the barite strips out all the sulfate or, or, or nearly all of the sulfate before you basically get to precipitating um, the, uh, the, the calcium sulfate. Isn't calcium rich system tap uh, ultramafic rocks uh, based on modern analogs? Um, ultramafic yes, rocks don't uh, have any calcium. Well, <laughs> I mean, 
in modern systems we have anhydrite, but I think I think a, I think one of the issues is that calcium concentrations may have been lower in the Archean oceans. Um, calcium sulfate yeah. has a short crustal residence time. Um, Garrels and Mackenzie. Right. Did we yeah. exhaust everything on this question? Uh, okay. I, I have a couple of questions. If I can. Well, uh, we have something from Lee Kump. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Lee Kump says in your calculations, I think talking about the calculations you said that you didn't touch on during the presentation, mm. um, but in the calculations, what is the 8786 strontium of the exposed felsic crust? Not. Uh, not a whole lot of leverage at 3.3, correct? Yes, that is absolutely correct. And um, so we basically did this as a, as a sort of best estimate taking, um, oh, I have to remember what we did. Um, basically averaging the modern average continental crust value. I, I would have to look this up. I don't remember exactly, but basically we just, we kind of did like a best a, a best estimate because as you mentioned, there is not really any, we don't really have any actual constraints from the rock record there. So we've just sort of taken the, um, the um, um, yeah, I'm trying to remember exactly, but I kind of have like a brain fart now. So, um, well, I can get back to you on that, but basically yeah, what we did. Yeah, I, I didn't mean yeah. to trip you yeah. up. Um, no, no, it, sorry. You know, I mean, it's, it, you know that, that to develop really radiogenic sources take time. And yes. so a, you know, our crust that formed, felsic crust that formed at you know, 3.8 is only gonna have a um, composition of something like 705, right? Uh, by the time you yes. get 3.3. So it's not like the, so the modern day, you know, you're looking at 3.8 crust and it can be a, you know, uh, very high um, uh, strontium isotope ratios, but um, just not a lot of leverage with that early young crust, right? Yeah. Young crust, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I agree. So this would have to be crust that was actually around for for quite a while already before it started to weather. So this must have been, I don't mean, I don't Old stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Thanks. Thanks for very your very interesting work. <laughs> thanks. I cast a nice. So we've got one more comment before we can get we go on to Andre's question. Uh, Juan Juan Cui says, just a comment. Maybe fluid inclusion analysis can better constrain the temperature of barite forming fluids. So. Yeah, it's an interesting comment, and um, I think we've looked into this, but it's very tricky to basically be sure that the fluid inclusions are actually representing uh, Archean the Archean system and not something more, more recent, but um, yeah, thanks. Okay, Andre, you said you had a couple of questions. Uh, so uh, first question, um, so you explain with sulfate concentration, uh, fractionation between sulfites and sulfates, uh, but it seems like you also have a different range in capital 33S and I didn't catch uh, if uh, for capital 33s versus capital 36, these two um, trends would be different on it. So how do you explain uh, this different range in capital 33s? Uh, that's the first question. Um, uh, yeah. I have a second one later. <laughs> uh, I, I'm talking about diagram when you show a barite rich and barite poor environments and we have yes, sort of different trends. Yeah. Uh, like this one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so how do you, so you explain difference in uh, delta 34S by different sulfate content, but you have also different range in capital 33S. So how does it link here? Um, yeah, maybe I don't understand your question. So you mean why why there is 
why yeah. the range in Delta 33S is is larger on in the barite free settings compared to the barite rich ones. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's actually a good question. Um, and um, I uh, I don't know. Maybe it has something to do with the with the mechanisms of. Um, I mean, to form to form pyrite from elemental sulfur requires, um, I mean, requires some requires more components than basically. I mean, you, you can you can do this in different ways, right? So you can have pyrite being formed by um, there's two mechanisms to form basically pyrite from elemental sulfur. You can. You can have sulfur if you have sulfate reduction. This is of course one thing, but maybe this is also mixing in of um, of elemental sulfur that that was less um, that was maybe just uh, no. I'd actually no. It's a good It's a good question. I'm actually not entirely sure how to answer this, but I guess um, I would I would expect that it has perhaps or would would if I have to suggest something I guess I would say that it maybe has something to do with the fact that the the sulfate is a soluble phase in seawater so it's perhaps just sort of a, a a more well mixed phase to start off with so when you basically reduce this um, then you don't get so much variation because the the starting point is quite homogeneous whereas if you start off with the elemental sulfur perhaps because this is not this is not a, a dissolved phase but it's, it's like um, or it, it can start off as a solid phase so that you basically keep more of that initial photochemical variation in your in your in your elemental sulfur record and so then when you basically reduce those or or when they undergo disproportionation you would get sort of more variation going up here simply because the starting material is sort of less well mixed as the than the salt in comparison to the sulfate. So, so but, it um, looks like uh, in your first on the left, you produce a lot of sulfates through photosynthesis, but you uh, somehow don't have much of elemental sulfur coming from atmosphere. And in the second one, you have much larger contribution of elemental sulfur. Yeah. So I. I wonder if this is just a, a matter of sort of microbial metabolisms out competing each other so that if you have enough sulfate around it, basically this is the dominant metabolism that we will see. And then, um, and so if sulfate is around, then the microbe, then the sulfate reducers are happy. And that's then the, 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 the metabolism that is, that is mostly expressed in the sulfur isotope record. Whereas if you have, disproportionation or we have you, you have low sulfate concentrations then basically it's sort of a less favorable habitat for the sulfate reducers to um, to live in so perhaps that's just less less expressed in that in that situation um, it could also have something to do with even like um, basically the redox conditions that you have if I remember correctly um, Elemental sulfur disproportionators, they don't like iron. And so he might have had like different variations in, in iron concentrations, for example, maybe because you have more slightly more oxidizing conditions when you have your when you have higher sulfate concentrations. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of speculation, but um, I would guess that basically what we're seeing is sort of just the competition between microbial metabolisms. And so if you have um, if you have more sulfate around, then you will mostly see sulfate reduction. And maybe elemental sulfur disproportionation happened, but it's just not expressed so strongly in the isotope record then. But it still needs somehow to get into rock record and be removed from atmosphere or from the ocean. And yeah, uh, so my second question, uh, so you had this free end models like with, uh, uh, sulfate comes from lighter volcanic eruption, uh, stronger continental weathering, or local, I guess, mm. conditions. Did you try uh, to uh, just back envelope kind of calculate, like if you have uh, eight 
uh, whatever millimoles of sulfate and in ocean if you take it all into atmosphere and then kind of uh, also add elemental sulfur that you also will produce how much of volcanic eruption you would require and uh, is it very large or, or reasonable and also maybe to take like what should be flux from continental weathering to provide this amount of sulfate yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting point. And the answer is no, I have not tried that. <laughs> but um, I, uh, I think this is definitely something that, that, that we could try. I mean, of course, you know, we don't really know, we don't necessarily have good constraints on the size of these basins that the barites formed in, but um, this is some, something that we can make, probably make some reasonable assumptions. And um, yeah, it's a very interesting point. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Shukai. Has a question. All right. Uh, yeah. So next we've got a question from Shuhai. Yes. Uh, so um, yeah, do you have a sense, you know, how much of the uh, sulfate that goes into the hydrothermal system was precipitated as barite as opposed to pyrite uh, or sulfite? Because uh, in modern, if I, I, I'm not entirely sure, but my, my, uh, uh, impression is that a modern hydrothermal system, much of the sulfate that goes into the system were removed as sulfide minerals. Or put it in another way, you know, why we don't see uh, in the, the Paleoarchean style of bad barite a modern hydrothermal system? Um, yeah, those are two interesting, very good questions. So I think your first answer, um, well, I think we have to think a little bit differently because, of course, these are key in hydrothermal systems. We have, first of all, much lower sulfate concentrations. And if we have a relatively low temperature system, like what we think the barites formed in, then processes like thermochemical sulfate reduction and even anhydride, anhydride precipitation, they would be much less um, significant, actually, for these settings. Because, for example, thermochemical sulfate reduction, just in modern systems, you know, we typically needs like 200, 250 degrees. So if the temperatures are not high enough, then this is not something that would maybe um, strip out the sulfate so much and turn it into, into sulfide. Um, so, um, yes, and your second question, why we don't find stratiform barite in the modern ocean and, um, I don't really have an answer for that. And I think it's an excellent question. It's something I've wondered about because um, in, for example, the, um, so in one of some of the systems that I work in the Norwegian Sea, there we actually have, we have barite chimneys. And this, so this is sort of as, as close as we can get, um, but we don't, we don't form stratiform barite. And perhaps this is because we have such higher, so much higher sulfate concentrations in seawater that basically, okay. Everything is just stripped out once the barium comes up to the seafloor. So it's sort of more difficult to, in a way, distribute this over a larger area, perhaps. I mean, um, but I, I, I don't really know. I don't really have a good explanation other than that I think that the, um, yes, of course, uh, barium is, of course, very limited compared to the Precambrian Ocean. But, you know, we might have basically a reverse system where in the in the precambrian we would have sulfate limitations and now we have barium limitations so um and also with barium coming from the barium comes is leached from from the host rocks in modern systems so in a way that should not really be a a, a, con, a limitation actually on on the formation of bedded barite so um i don't really know other than that, I think the systems were probably just different, different chemistry in the hydrothermal systems, different types of settings, but uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Great talk, by the way. Thanks. <laughs> okay, well, I think that's all the questions we have. Uh, no, read, read Juan Quiz uh, in the chat. The one you just said? Yeah, uh, he points yeah, out, that, that, yeah. That, is, that barium is limited in the in the in the uh, modern ocean. Yeah, Desiree addressed that as she was yeah. going. 
Um, but yeah, thanks for, for looking out for that. Um, and I was so, yeah. looking uh, for carbonate system around hydrothermal uh, vents. And uh, one example is Lost City, which is apparently very rare in modern oceans. So, so carbonate is not uh, so common around hydrothermal systems. No, yeah. that's correct. I mean, Lost City is a kind of a unique place because this is where we have serpentinization. So it does is indeed connected to ultramafic rocks. Um, but that's not necessarily the settings I think that we're dealing with with the barites here. We don't. Um, and uh, on yeah. another hand, barite was described as a cap on low temperature hydrothermal systems in modern ocean. Well, you probably know it much more about it than me. Uh, but are modern hydrothermal systems, low temperature hydrothermal systems, that are tapped kept by barites. It's not unusual to have barites around the different systems. Mm -hmm. I'm just answering to Sean Badara. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, so thanks again, Desiree, for your presentation today. It was really good and generated a lot of good uh, discussion, which we always love to see. So, <laughs> so thank you again for that. So as for everybody else, thank you for coming. Um, and we hope to see you next week for Eric Sperling and a couple of, of his collaborators um, on, on their geochemical database. So until then, stay safe. Um, see you next week. Desiree, get out, uh, yeah. to the west, get out to the Western Nice region. That's the most uh, <laughs> spectacular uh, display of metamorphic geology on the earth. Yeah, I pretty much live on that. So, uh, but yeah, <laughs> it is, it is, uh, I mean, coming from the Netherlands, you know, I, I can't really complain about the, the rock uh, outcrops here in Norway.